Amen. 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 There is definitely a sweet spirit in this house. And I know that it is the spirit of the, of the Lord. So I want to rest there as we just sit in a space of gratitude, of grace, of knowing that God works in mysterious ways. And knowing that we don't always understand what God is doing or why God is doing it. But we trust God that it will work for our good. So in that somberness, in that reality, uh, we... God has, has led me to a book that is normally not preached from, as the ministry team will know. And it is the book of Lamentations. And in the sense of the word, you can remain seated this morning as I read the text. But I'll be reading from the book of Lamentations, chapter 3, verses 1 through 9, and then we'll jump down to verses 19 through 30. Now I'll be reading from the New Living Translation, the NLT. Oh, yeah, I did. <laughs> uh, the Book of Lamentations, chapter 3, verses 1 through 9, and then jumping down to verses 19 through 30. Reading from the New Living Translation, the Word of God reads as such, I am the one who has seen the afflictions that come from the rod of the Lord's anger. He has led me into darkness, shutting out all light. He has turned his hand against me again and again all day long. He has made my skin and flesh grow old. He has broken my bones. He has besieged and surrounded me with anguish and distress. He has buried me in a dark place like those long dead. He has walled me in and I cannot escape. He has bound me in heavy chains, and though I cry and shout, he has shut out my prayers. He has blocked my way with the high stone wall. He has made my road crooked. That was verses 1 through 9. Now jump down to verses 19 through 30, if you will. Verse 19 reads, The thought of my sufferings and homelessness is bitter beyond words. I will never forget this awful time as I grieve over my loss. But verse 21 says, yet, someone say yet. Yet, yet I still dare to hope when I remember this. The faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease. Great is thy faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. I say to myself, the Lord is my inheritance. In some version it says, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who depend on him, to those who search for him. So it is good to wait quietly for salvation from the Lord. And it is good for people to submit at an early age to the yoke of his discipline. Let them sit alone in silence beneath the Lord's demands. Let them lie face down in the dust, for there may be hope at last. Let them turn their other cheek to those who strike them and accept the insults of their enemies. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and most of all, carrying out of God's holy word. Now, I want to speak from the topic this morning, I need to sit with it. Yeah. I, I, I need to sit with it. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. I need to sit with it. We've used that phrase a few times when decisions are pending, decisions are looming, and people are trying to push you faster than you are trying to go, and you're like, hold on just a little minute. I need to sit with this for a little while. I need to ponder. I need to pray, and I need to seek God about it. Story goes that there was a little boy who was visiting his grandparents, and he was given his first slingshot, and Lord have mercy. Why would you give a little boy a slingshot? But the little boy was going to practice in the woods, but he could never quite hit his target. 
As he came back to grandma's backyard, he spied her pet duck. Yes, grandma had a pet duck. That's how they do it in the South, amen. <laughs> then on an impulse, he, 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 he took aim and let the slingshot or let the rock fly from the slingshot and the stone hit its target, killing grandma's pet duck. The boy panicked, of course, desperately. He hid the dead duck in the wood pie only to look and see that his sister was watching. Sister Sally. Sister Sally had been, had been watching, and not only was Sally watching, Sally had seen it all. But Sally didn't say anything, of course. After lunch that day, Grandma said, Sally, let's wash the dishes. But Sally said, well, Johnny told me that he wanted to help in the kitchen. <laughs> Didn't you say that, Johnny? <laughs> and she went and whispered to Johnny, remember the duck? <laughs> so Johnny did the dishes. Later, Grandpa came around, asked the children if they wanted to go fishing. Grandma said, I'm sorry, but I need Sally to help make supper. And Sally smiled again and said, well, that's all taken care of because Johnny would like to help in the kitchen and make supper. Again, she whispered to Johnny, remember the duck? Johnny stayed while Sally went fishing. After several days of, of Johnny doing both his chores and Sally's chores, he could not stand it any longer. He confessed to Grandma that he'd killed her pet duck. Grandma said, I know Johnny. She said, giving him a hug, as grandmas do. I was standing at the window and saw the whole thing because I love you. I forgave you. And I wondered how long you would let Sally make you your slave, make you her slave. So I wonder how long you would let Sally make you a slave. That's a real touching and we can kind of put ourselves in that story of understanding that we've done some things where we thought nobody was looking. Thought we got away with some things, but all the while somebody was watching. And somebody always knew, and then that person who knew it sometimes blackmail you for those of us who have siblings, older or younger. We were either on the receiving end of that blackmail or the ones giving that blackmail. But it is this reality that we become slaves to things where we thought forgiveness was impossible. And Johnny was so stricken about what he had done that he couldn't be honest and trustworthy with grandmother, so he'd rather be someone else's slave rather than to live into the truth of what he had done. Now, as we are living in this time, it just continues to baffle me as I was again reading from Lamentations to lament is to mean it means to be sorrowful. It means to really sit with something that doesn't resonate, that doesn't make you happy, that does not bring you joy. To lament means to sit with something, to sit with something so heavy, to, with, to sit with something so dark that, that the only way you can come out of it is to speak your truth. And the reality is that as, as black folks, that black people, we have always been the people to forgive without apology. We've been one of the main uh, people who, 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 who so much violence and so much turmoil and, and destruction has befallen us that, that we are, we have been taught to, we are forgiving people. But sometimes we forgive without repentance, without those who have caused us harm, repenting for what they have done and, and turning their ways. That the question becomes, how can we forgive someone who is not sorry for what they have done? That is really what the gospel is. That's, that's really what forgiveness is. But when, when we look at scripture, we understand that, that scripture, when, when, when someone is forgiven, they, they, are a, they are also accountable to restoring what was lost. That forgiving somebody is not just lip service, but it is actually saying it and then doing it to repair, to, 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 to restore what has been taken. That is what we even see in the text when Jesus was even clear that repentance is the necessary condition for forgiveness. There in the Gospel of Luke chapter 17, Jesus says, If your brother or sister sins, rebuke them, and if they repent, forgive them. And if they sin against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, then you must forgive them. But understanding 
the context of, of what we have dealt with and, and the realities that we have, as black folks have, have had to endure from chattel slavery to, to Jim Crow to the new Jim Crow and, and to what we are still witnessing today. That there are some people who need to repent. And it ain't us. Because they not like us. The spirit just gave me that one. I like that one. <laughs> they, they, they not like us. The context for Lamentations here is it, 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 this uh, chapter 3 focuses on the lamenter's personal suffering. His, it is his unwavering, but, but, um, his wavering between both hope and despair, his fluctuation between surrendering and acceptance of the situation on the one hand, and, and yet he has pain, he has cries, and is struggling on the other hand. There is no question of how this could have happened as it is found in other uh, uh, other chapters within Lamentations, but, but it is the current description of what this current lamenter is going through, and, and it is always the context for our for, for biblical uh, study and biblical uh, uh, um, uh, exegesis is that we understand that just as the United States is an empire, that, that those who are in the Bible were battling against empires, ancient empires who, who waged wars of conquest to expand their territory and, and to increase their resources sources and, and no thought of the land that they were invading and then want to condemn and, and demonize those who they took from as if they did something wrong lamentations is is really sitting with something it is sitting with the reality of our dear sister Sonia Massey as the hashtags continue sit with the reality that has she had her encounter with the police state that even before they entered her household she said do not harm me and even as she did what was instructed she even knew in the spirit she said I rebuke you in the name of Jesus not even knowing what was going to happen in the next coming second it is to lament, loved ones. It's okay to sit with it. You don't got to sit with it for long. You don't got to sit with it forever, but we have to take time to sit with it. That's why I'm grateful for the language that we find here in Lamentations. I, it's heavy, it's hard. It, it hits home, it says, I am the one, even though it's communal, even though we may not have known Sonia personally, she is still a sister. She was still a daughter, a mother, a friend. Lamentation says, I am the one who has seen the afflictions and it feels like, God, why are we still having to deal with this? The text says that it feels like God has led us into the darkness, shutting out the light that God has turned his anger against us that he has made our fleshes grow old and, and, and feeble that even that that this is seems like a new phenomenon that that even though police brutality has been around since the beginning of time that understanding that the creation of police was slave patrol it was policing the bodies of black folks since we got onto these these uh, grounds and it is still the same thing today feels like God has buried us in a dark place and that God has shut out our prayers that our suffering and and this homelessness this this uh what what it said uh back in uh, I believe Psalms is like how how can we sing how can we sing songs in a strange land how can we continue to to continue to create culture when when they love our culture but hate our bodies this suffering and homelessness how when we, we can't go back to Africa because we're not even, if we talk about it, we sit with it, right? Take it from a land that we no longer are welcomed into. Forced to live in a land that we are not welcomed into. Now forced, even when we have to go on vacation, we still need a green book to know where are the safest places, even in the Caribbean islands. But I love verse 21, Minister 10. That contrasting conjunction. Y'all remember conjunction, junction? What's your function? 
That even though we sit with that reality, verse 21 comes and says, Yet I still hope. Yet. Yet I still dare to hope. When I remember that the faithful love of the Lord never ends. God's mercies never cease. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, towards me. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who depend on him, to those who search. Are you searching for God even in the midst of such turmoil, even in the midst of such destruction? Yet you ought to be daring enough. Have the audacity, the unmitigated God to say, I still know that God is in the works. I know that God is still faithful. I know that God's mercies are new each and every day. The question becomes, how and why do we sit with such agony, such lament? When we hold all of the hashtags to our hearts, Sonia, Philando, Eric, Mike, Sandra, Brittany, Trayvon. When we hold them, we sit with it, Oscar. But sitting with it doesn't mean we just remain idle or that we just grieve. But sitting with it allows us to have some introspection about how we come back out and help to change the systems that we live into. So why should we sit with it? I'm glad you asked. It's, it's understand it's there in the text, verses 27 through 30, drop three, three points and we, we, can, we can stand up with it. <laughs> but the first thing is, is that sitting with it allows us to remember to be youthful and not childish. There's a difference between being youthful and being childish. Verse 27 says, and it is good for people to submit at an early age to the yoke of discipline. It is good for people to submit at an early age. Then you, see, you, may, you may be saying, Brother President, well, Paul said that, Paul said, I put away childish things. Paul said, when I was a child, I spake as a child, and, and I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became an adult, when I became a man or a woman, I put away childish things. See, Paul uses it as an adjective. Childish is, you act in childish, right? But then Jesus declared in Matthew that when they had called the little child up to them, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself themselves like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus uses youthfulness as a noun. It is, it is who you are and what you are becoming. There is a difference between youthful and childish. Childish folks are, are those who grew up and who were bullied and, and now they think they ought to become the bully. I'm in no ways romanticizing bully, but, but we understand that folks who, who, who will look down on as young folks and, and then once they get a little taste of power, they then themselves become the bullies. That's, that's childish. Childish folks is when they realize that they are becoming the minority when we are now of the global majority and, and they get happy trigger, fi happy trigger fingers and, and they, they police act like chill. They act childish. Because they understand that their power is being taken away from them. But Jesus says we are to be youthful. That we are to be like damsels in distress. That no matter how much power we may walk into, no matter how great you may be, no matter how big your name may get, that when you are youthful, you remember that no matter how of an adult you may become, that you are still in need of some saving. That children are, are still in need of understanding. They need someone to look after them, to, to come up after them, to forgive them when they make mistakes. That we are called not to be childish, but to be youthful. To understand that to be young and youthful in spirit is to understand that you are always in the space to be taught something. That you're always in the space to learn and to glean and to never think that you got all your ducks in a row. Some of us got some missing ducks. Some of us ain't even in the pond at all. 
you can take with that what you make. The call is when we sit with something, when we sit with the heaviness of this, it is reminding ourselves, and even in our personal, when we get in disagreements, and, and we know our first inclination in our human, human nature, it is to act childish. You, you know, it's tit for tat, eye for eye for an eye. But what's the common, common adage? If, 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 if it was eye for an eye, everybody would be blind. So we are called to be youthful. Like, what is it that I can learn in this moment before I respond? but not to be childish. So when we sit with it, we are called to be youthful, not childish. And then secondly, it is adjusting. When we sit with it, we get time and take time to adjust our positioning to both God and to people. We adjust our positioning to both God and to the people. Verse 28 through and 29 says, let them sit alone in silence beneath the Lord's demands. Let them lie face down in the dust for there may be hope at last let them turn the other cheek to those who strike them and and you know we 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 kind of gloss by them nowadays but the ten commandments really 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 really, really honker us down amen the ten commandments were really the foundation and are the foundation of our faith and we understand that the first four is dealing with our relationship with god the vertical relationship. The last six deal with how we are to deal with one another, our horizontal relationships. The first four commandments right? you shall have no other gods before me. You shall make no idols. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain and to keep the Sabbath day holy. Those four are staples to how we relate and should relate to our God. Then the last six, right? Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And then you shall not covet. Now this is the law and the foundation of our faith. And even when Jesus came, Jesus says, uh, don't misunderstand why I have come. Jesus said, I did not come to abolish the law of, the Mo of Moses or the writings of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish their purpose. He said, I, Jesus said, I tell you the truth. Until heaven and earth disappear, not even the smallest detail of God's law will disappear until its purpose is achieved. So if you ignore the, le the least commandment and teach others to do the same, you will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But to anyone who obeys God's laws and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. That, that I just implore you to go back and, and sit with the Ten Commandments a little while. That it may not be that abrupt in your life and you say well maybe I haven't murdered anybody I haven't I haven't committed any adultery I haven't uh, stolen anything but but I believe there are some intangible things that we have done some of us have robbed some people of their dreams some of us have, have beat down people to to a point where they couldn't build themselves back up that, that there are some real other ways that that these Ten Commandments come alive but we don't understand those until we go back and sit with it because Jesus was clear. I didn't come to abolish what was written. I came to accomplish it. But understanding that how rigid and how rigid these may be, that Jesus' way of interpreting and bringing life these commandments and how we lived was always done with love and mercy and patience. That when we sit with it, understand that we are called to be youthful and not childish. But understanding that it may be God allowing us time to readjust our positioning not only to God but with each other that is what happens when we are able to sit with it and lastly it allows us to increase our spiritual stamina it's a workout when you sometimes sit down some of us are so busy moving that it hurts to sit still ain't that something <laughs> some of us are so busy in life that when we stop moving all the pain that you were trying to ignore, all the pain that you were trying to get past, it all hits you. As soon as you hit that, sit down. That's why when you, when you, especially when you get to cleaning something good, don't mess around and sit down because you ain't getting back up. 
But when we sit with it in spirit, in mind, in body, it allows us to increase our spiritual stamina. It says it here, that last few words, it says to accept the insults of their enemies. I wrestled with that one a little bit. I was like, God, now, God, now come on now. And then the Christian walk is already hard enough. Now you, I, I, can, I can forgive my enemies and I know you told me you would turn my enemies into my footstools. You know, I, I'm praying for them and I already turned the other cheek. But now I have to accept the insults of their enemies. But he began to talk to me. He was like, Jay, you know, we ought to say, you know, if you can, if you can send a punch, you ought to be able to take a punch. St. Langston Hughes said it better. Black folks, sweet and docile, meek, humble, and kind, beware the day that they change their minds. That when we sit with it and understand that this is, a, this is something for rejuvenation, for recuperating, that, that it is understanding that when we sit with something, it is allowing us time to sit and strategize and to sit and understand that where is this hurt? Where is this lament? really coming from that that we when, we when we really sit with it and understand not to respond with uh, childish actions and, and understanding that this is an opportunity for us to readjust our positioning with God and with each other that personally it increases our spiritual stamina I love you know I go back and forth with who is my favorite superhero but but I do love Black Panther Black Panther whose whose uniform would absorb the power Anytime the enemy threw something at him, it wouldn't just bounce off of him. It would, he would absorb it. I like that analogy. Black Panther's suit was infused with vibranium, which absorbed nearly all of the kinetic energy. That, why, that was why he, he was able to jump even on a live grenade and, and it would blow up into him and he would just harness that energy and then push it back to where it needed to go. And I just thought about to tell you that some of us all of us that we are equipped with some vibranium suits that any enemy target that any fiery dart that any arrows by night that hit us that that even though we may feel a little pinch we may feel a little steam but but god has equipped us to absorb the insults of our enemies to absorb it so that we may redirect that the energy that we live in, that the energy that we understand, this vibranium, though we, we love uh, Wakanda, Wakanda forever, but, but in the reality that that vibranium in the church is known as the blood of Jesus. It is the blood of Jesus, that, that grace and mercy that, that flowed from Emmanuel's veins, that is the energy that we live in. There was a story that a mother once approached Napoleon, the, the king Napoleon, and, and she was seeking pardon for her son, and the emperor replied that the young man had created a, a certain offense twice, and, and justice had demanded death, but, but the mother said, I didn't ask for justice, I plead for mercy, but... Napoleon said, your son does not deserve mercy. And, and Napoleon replied in the mother's side, the mother replied and cried. She said, if it was mercy, uh, it would not be mercy if I deserved it. And the mercy is all I ask for. And, and every now and again, you ought to look back over your life and realize that justice demanded your death, that, that justice demanded that you not get to the next level. Justice demanded that you not get that promotion, but by the blood of Jesus, by Jesus' mercy, that even though you did not deserve it, you still got it. That even though you did not deserve it, you still got it. Because that's what happened. On that hill called Calvary, when they nailed him to that cross, that mercy and grace even in the midst of violence, even the violence that Jesus even took on in his own body. That your sin and my sin, like that vibranium suit, Jesus absorbed all of that. Absorbed all of the sins of this world. So much so that it separated him from God. You really understand that? 
When we talk about the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, that the only time, that every time that Jesus prayed, Jesus was literally going face to face with God. But the only time that God and Jesus could not see face to face was when our sin got in the way. But he descended down into hell. Did some good work down there. Got in some more good trouble down there. Took back the keys. And early on that third day, on that Sunday morning, Earl came up with all power in his hand. I know this world sometimes makes us feel powerless. Just as the lamenter said, it feels like even God is against us. That God has shut out our prayers. But I don't know about you, but yet I dare to hope. I dare to live. I dare to continue to fight for justice. Because Dr. King said a threat to justice anyway. It's a threat to justice everywhere. So beloved, I, I hope I did leave you with some hope that the blood still works. That it reaches to the highest mountain and, and down to the lowest valleys. But there is a, still the reality that you need to sit with some things. But it is not to sit idly. It is not just to sit for the sake of sitting but to remember that God has called us to be youthful, to remember your childhood, to remember that, that there is always something new to learn and something even new to express. That when we sit and slow down, that it allows us to readjust our relationship with God and with each other, evident through the Ten Commandments and even through the parables of Jesus. But just as you work out physically, you need some spiritual stamina too. That as you take the, the darts and the arrows of Satan and all of his adversaries, remember that you can absorb that, pray about it, and lay it at the altar. 